Hi everyone, this is Jan Kabili and my co-host Ron Clifford and our helper Dave Bell and our special guest Mark S. Johnson all welcoming you to this episode of the Photoshop Show. This is the 43rd time that we've been with all of you and we're really excited tonight to have one of our good friends, Mark Johnson. Mark is a Photoshop expert and such a great teacher um, and he is also an artist. And really that's the secret, I think, to being good at Photoshop is having that sense of design and art. And Mark, you certainly have it. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Mark, what are you going to show us tonight? Give us a little trailer of what's coming up. Uh, well, if we have time, I'm going to show three techniques. Uh, first one is I'm going to show you a killer trick for um, adding grunginess to any photo. Uh, then I'm going to show you something I call photo tangling, um, which can be used with any combination of photos to create something that's just beautifully unique. And uh, time permitting, I'm going to show you how to very stylishly combine text with photos. Oh, I've seen that before. That's very cool. I hope we do have time for that. Neat. Well, we're looking forward to all that from Mark. And um, before we do, I want to have everybody else say hi. Go on, you guys. Somebody say hi. Hi. <laughs> Who are you? It's great to be here again. Um, you know, some some great things uh, happening today. Google uh, announcing some new stuff in Google Plus. Fun to watch some of that. And Nick adding their new analog effects. Um, module. Looks like something fun to play with. But uh, anyway, always great to be here on the Photoshop show. Thank you. Yes, I watched that too. That When, when we say that, we're talking about, I think it was called the morning um, announcement or something by Google, and it was Vic Andrada, and he was talking about at least 18 new features have been added to Google+, Plus. most of them in the photo and video realm. And there are some neat things, including a new HDR filter for Snapseed, um, which is the kind of semi-automatic um, app that Google now offers, both in the desktop and mobile. And then what you're talking about is a brand new app in the Google Knit collection, right, Dave? Yes. Uh, to my understanding, add some of the uh, old old-time film um, effects. I mean, you know, there there are a few of these effects we find in, um, you know, like the the uh, Instagrams, but you know, this has a lot more control, a lot more finesse of what you can do to, to, to just really pull some of that you know old film feel out of a lot of your photos. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The few examples that Vic showed looked really good there, you know, because first of all, all the Nick software is great. And it looks like this one, it looks sort of like filters that, as you say, emulate classic film stocks and also um, emulate different lens lengths. He showed a little bit of a depth of field example so that you could take a photo that wasn't blurry in the background and quickly have that happen. So I'm very um, looking forward to using those products. Dan, where are those available? Well, the um, the new one, which is called Analog Effects, I believe, is that right, Dave? Yes. Uh, that's available as part of the Google Nick collection, which Google is selling for 149 bucks for the entire collection of Nick software, which includes that new one plus Silver Effects Pro, HDR Effects, Color Effects, all my favorite um, plugins for Lightroom and Photoshop. Yeah, I, I love them too. Is and and do you know what the uh, upgrade cost is going to be for people who already own the collection? Zero. Ah. <laughs> Zero. That uh, sounds good to me. Is it will yeah. roll out automatically to people over time, but if you want to get it right away, you can go ahead and uh, if you you know whatever you use to to download your Nick collection to begin with, you should be able to go in and or at least download. Uh, the trial again. Some people have done it that way, and it'll include the whole thing and just reinstall right over top of what you have, and and you'll have that included as well as um, included with the whole package. Beautiful, thanks. It sounds great. And then there were also um, some very interesting video features announced. Do you you have you guys seen how when um, if you upload photos to Google Plus and they have motion in them, currently Google Plus will just make you. Um, some kind of motion, you know, they'll, they'll like include all those photos in a kind of a, a animated package. gif. What's it called? An animated, an animated gif, right? GIF. I couldn't think of it. Which, you know, if you like animated gifs, cool. But now they've extended that concept um, to a couple of other areas, including video, so that if you upload a video, there's all this stuff that will happen to it automatically, including splicing right. together different clips and looks it's great. Like movie, it's, it's like movie awesome. They'll automatically and intuitively find not just the movie clips, but stills that may have been shot at the same time and put it together in a complete movie for you. It's 
I'm, I'm curious to see how well it works, but the kind of technology that they're putting behind this and putting out to the public is just fantastic. It's really amazing. Yeah. And one, one feature I think I'm going to really enjoy playing with is uh, it's good for landscape photographers trying to shoot where there are those pesky other people walking around is the, the uh, kind of auto erase. If you just set your tripod down and just, you know, particularly, say, in a city of architecture, you know, you can just sit there and take multiple shots so you know you have enough shots to, to cover the whole thing. And rather than, I, mean, I know you can do this in Photoshop using the, the median filter, but uh, you should be able to upload those and it will generate auto-generate uh, a clean view of what you were shooting with all, anything that was moving in any of the pictures, it will, it will erase them. Yeah, that is kind of cool. Well, we'll take a look at some of those maybe in a future show. Um, but for now, we want to get to uh, some Lightroom and Photoshop content. And I actually have something very short to show you tonight that is part of the new features in Lightroom 5.2, which is the latest version of Lightroom that was released, I believe, in mid-September. And this is something that I find really useful. And that is, in addition to the noise reduction, sliders, one for smoothing out modeled areas. I have to show you what that means because it's hard, what's a modeled area, but I get this a lot, particularly in really dark areas of photos or in if I, if I happen to shoot underexposed and then I try to open up those dark areas. So here I have, can you, oh wait, I'm trying to share my screen but I forgot to click on the button. <laughs> that would be helpful, wouldn't it? All right, here we go. Now, can you see my Lightroom? Yes, we can. So here's a photo where the sky is pretty nicely exposed, um, but the foreground is too dark. Very typical problem. And one way to handle that in Lightroom would be to just go and grab one of those local adjustment tools, maybe the adjustment brush tool. I've got my exposure ramped up a bit on that tool. Maybe I'll even try to increase the shadow setting a bit. And then I'm just going to run the tool with the auto mask checked over the foreground. Now I see already that's that's too uh, much increase to exposure, but I just want to get it brightened up down there a little bit, and then we can go back over and play with those settings. Maybe we'll reduce that increase in shadows and bring the exposure down a little bit. You know, so now when you're looking at this photo in this view, let me close that adjustment brush. In this view where it's fit on screen, you know, at least you can see what's in the foreground. But watch what happens when I zoom into one-to-one -one view, which is where, of course, you should be if you're going to be evaluating for noise or sharpness. So I'm just going to click on the image and then hold my space. Click on the image and just, <laughs> I thought I was in Photoshop for a moment. And then click and drag down. Now there's a lot of problems with these dark areas, but the problem I want you to focus on is what you see here in the street. Can you see that they're kind of, it looks like a rainbow almost in the street there? Yes. Maybe if I even zoom in, I'm going to go up and get the two to one zoom. Oh, there. Now you can see that area better. So I don't know any way to get rid of that, at least until Lightroom 5.2. If I go to the detail panel in the develop module and I go down to the noise reduction sliders, normally I would work with just the luminance and the color sliders. That's what we had up till now with, a, with some detail and contrast sliders there, but they didn't really do too much from what I could see. So I'm going to take the luminance slider and turn it all the way off and the color slider and turn it all the way off because I want you to really see that's the noise in this photo because it was so dark and then I you know, brought, brought back um, some of the content in the dark areas. Now this was shot at an ISO of 200, so that isn't the problem. It's just that it was dark down there in the exposure. So, you know, what would you do normally? Mark, what would you do at this point? You know, Jan, I, I don't have a very good feed on you right now, so I'm, a, I'm unfortunately, I, I can't answer that. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> no worries. I put you on the spot. I'm just trying to get it so I'm not giving everybody a lecture. Well, what do you guys, do you guys ever use noise reduction, Dave or, or I, um, Ron? I do. I, I, often, I often do use the Nick uh, plugin, the Define plugin, which uh, does some auto sampling, but I, I know that Lightroom has some amazing light uh, uh, noise reduction as well. Well, that's right. The Nick plugins are good, but even if you don't have them, in the old days, here's what normally I would tell people to do, is um, you could just leave the luminance and color uh, sliders at their defaults, but because I drag them over to zero to show you what they do, um, watch what happens if I take the color slider and I drag it back over to the right. Eventually, the color noise disappears, and I don't have to go too far. 
maybe just to about the default of 25. And now we do still see noise there, but it's all grayscale noise, which is luminance noise. So the next step would be to go to the luminance slider and drag that over to the right until you start to get rid of that grayscale noise. But the problem is that we still have that rainbow, if you look closely. And that's what I was referring to when I said kind of large areas of, of mottled color that yeah. remain. And so, in Lightroom 5.2, they give us yet one more feature to handle this problem. And that is the smoothest, the smoothness slider, it's hard to say, in the noise reduction section of this detail panel in Lightroom's develop module. And watch now, I'm going to drag that over to the right. And eventually, the rainbow is gone. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty well, that's smooth, interesting. Yeah. It, 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 where the slider is implies to me that it would only be... Uh, applying to the color, you know, there's like a dividing line in between the two. Well, it is. I think that it is because that noise is color. Oh. So if I take it okay. back, the, the problem is this: the color, but it's different than, like, look, here's the regular, uh, There, there's the regular color noise. It's oh. pixel-based noise. So, you know, we've been able to get the color noise out of at the pixel level for a long time, but this is different. This isn't noise at the pixel level. It's more like uh, big areas of, of color um, anomaly, I guess I would call it, which now you get rid of from the smoothness slider. And I'm not seeing, I'm not actually seeing it for some reason. But Jan, is is it is it more is it a more pattern? It kind of mm -hmm. looks like more, but it's not in a more pattern, Mark. It's, Good it's more like a mottled banding. Yeah, sm okay. smudge, almost smudging. It's it's like yeah. banding, but not consistent. Yeah. Exactly true, Ron. That's how they technically describe it as bands of modeled color or modeled banding. So anyway, um, experiment with some of your own photos where you have dark areas or if you've got the whole thing you know, underexposed and you know, get in there in a one-to-one -one view and really look at the color um, and see if you can uh, make things better with the new smoothness slider. Of course, you do have to upgrade the free update to Lightroom 5.2 for those who own Lightroom 5. There is no Lightroom 5.1, by the way. They skipped that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind touching on the that uh, the um, details slider? Uh, sorry, the contrast slider in the under the uh, luminance. Oh yeah, that's nothing. That's been there for a while. So under the luminance uh, noise reduction slider, they give you detail and contrast sliders. And the purpose is when you when you um, remove luminance noise. I th I'm not sure exactly what's going on under the hood, but it tends to soften the detail and the contrast in the image so that, you know, it kind of looks all smooth, like weirdly smooth. And so if you need to bring back detail, you've got a detail slider under luminance that you can drag to the right to try to bring some detail back as well as some more contrast. And the same is true under the color noise reduction slider. There's a detail slider there if you're losing detail in, in, in the color areas. But honestly, I never really use those sliders because I don't like, I don't know, they, they give this odd, they kind of bring back the noise and I've never been real thrilled with them. But I really like the smoothness slider. Okay? Yeah, that's great. All right, so let me come back and join you guys. And, you know, it's really neat that even in um, these, even in these um, dot updates, they call them, they offer a few new features, and there are others too. I can show you some more at some other time. Cool. Okay. So Mark, you have the floor. Outstanding. Well, so uh, tonight I'm going to begin with, um, I, I don't even know if you, I'd call this a full-blown technique. It's more like a, just kind of a great trick. And uh, this, is, this is the grunge, drama, and edginess secret weapon. Uh, pretty cool little technique here. Uh, as I s share my screen, I want to make sure that it's sharing properly because, as I say, I was unable to see your presentation there. So just let me know here um, if uh, you are seeing my bridge right now. You should see a baseball player with a tornado bat. Is that what you're seeing? That's right. We see that. Yeah. Outstanding. Okay. So this image that you see right here is um, it's, it's a perfect example, at least in my opinion, of something – uh, where you would want to use this technique. So anything that has kind of an edge to it, um, and when I say edge, I mean edginess to it, is going to be a great candidate for um, using this technique. So I do this a lot with um, kind of my edgy photo composites that are uh, a favorite of mine. And um, 
in order to accomplish this, we're actually going to be using uh, the HDR toning feature in Photoshop. But to get the HDR toning feature to work the way we want it to work, we actually have to um, duplicate our image here because HDR toning will only work on a one-layer document. And um, we're just going to pretend that, say this is my photo composite. I've got multiple layers in here. Um, I can't run HDR toning on this specific document. So what you do first is pop over here to Image and choose Duplicate. So you're creating a duplicate that you can tone. Um, and this is kind of just a file that you'll use temporarily. It's a throwaway file. You won't need it for very long. All right, so here it is. Now, if this were actually a layered document I was working on, um, I would choose layer and flatten image. But as you can see, I don't have multiple layers in here right now. So I would flatten the document right now. If you don't flatten, the nice thing is when you choose image, adjustments, and HDR toning, if it's a layered document, it's going to tell you. It's going to bring up an alert dialog and say, hey, listen, I, I only work on flattened documents. So it's going to allow you to flatten at that stage. So I'm going to image adjustments, HDR toning. And when I get in here, um, since this is going to be used just as this sort of um, unique layer that will apply to the original photo, I want to drain all the color out of here because if I leave the color in, it's going to create some issues. So I'm going to start with the saturation slider and just drain the color away here. Now what I want to do is pop up to the detail slider and I want to crank this up so that I can start to see some of that edginess popping into the scene. Is that is that showing up well enough? You guys seeing that detail coming out? Absolutely. Yeah, quite quite well. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And then um, I head on over to radius and strength here, and um, really, you just want to play around with these until you get a look that is edgy. It's something edgy that you like. So there is no formula here. You're just going for something that kind of has that grunge grungy look. Um, I'm going to back off from that a little bit. I felt like my shadows were getting kind of strong. And this overall looks a little bit um, bright to me in the highlight regions. So I'm going to go down to the highlight slider right here and back off those highlights a little bit. Try to, try to rope those in. There we go. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I might even punch out the detail just a little bit more. So right now I have this nice looking kind of um, edgy black and white HDR toned image. Uh, it definitely has it has some halos and things like that around the edges, but don't worry about those during this step. So I'll go ahead and press OK. And now I'm going to take this document, and I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it into my original composite um, as a new layer. So I'll just choose Select All, which is Command or Control A for people who are a little more uh, used to working in Photoshop. And then I'll do an Edit Copy which is Command or Control C. All right, now I'll pop over to my other document. And in here, I'll choose Edit, Paste. So Command or Control V. All right, so there it is. I've got my toned HDR layer here sitting on top of the original image. Now, this would work even if this were a layered document. I would just want to make sure that I, I paste this at the top of the stack. Um, but it would work even if this file were, were a layered document. Now, um, in order to blend this with the color image below and add in that edginess, I'm going to use a blend mode. And there are three blend modes that work particularly well here. Uh, the first is overlay, second is soft light, and the third is hard light. Each of these is going to give you a different look, so try them all. So I go up here to the blend mode pull down where it says normal, and I'll choose overlay. All right, and let me just turn the uh, visibility on and off for this layer so you can see that's overlay. Overlay is a bit strong for me. If I like it in general, but it's a bit strong, I could always just hover over the uh, word opacity here in the layers panel, and I could just scrub to the left, and I could reduce the opacity. But before I do that, I want to see what else is out there. So I'm going to look at soft light and hard light as well. Here is soft light. And again, let me turn off visibility so you can see before and after. And then here is hard light. You know, the interesting thing about hard light right here is um, if you're familiar with Nick Software's um, Color Effects Pro plugin and you're familiar with the bleach bypass filter that's in there, 
using this technique and working with the hard light blend mode creates something very similar to the look of bleach bypass. Um, again, that's a bit too strong for me uh, personally, so I could hover over the opacity slider right here and scrub to the left if I wanted and back down the effect till it's right where I want it. And I kind of like that look right there. Now, as I look at that, I say, well, that's, that's powerful. And let me actually zoom this up so you can see it a little better. So here's before the um, edginess and here's after. As I look at that, I, I might say, well, gee, I want this effect to apply to the baseball player and the bat and the tornado, but maybe not quite as much to the field of blowing grass or the storm clouds behind the baseball player. So if that's the case, um, I'm going to use Photoshop's most wonderful feature, which is a layer mask. All right, so um, come over here to this um, grungy layer that we have. And I'm going to click on the front-loading washing machine right down here and add a layer mask. Now, anywhere where I want to remove this effect, I can paint with 100% black. But I don't think I want to remove it. I think I just want to sort of get out a piece of sandpaper and just sort of, uh, you know, reduce the impact of it. So that means I'm going to use the brush tool here. Black is my foreground color. I've got the soft edge brush activated right here. And instead of painting with 100% opacity, which is going to completely remove the effect, I want to go with something less than that, maybe 50%. So I'll just tap the 5 key, and that'll set my opacity for the brush to 50%. I can make the brush bigger by tapping on the right bracket. So I've tapped on the right bracket to make the, br make the brush bigger. And now when I paint over these areas outside of the baseball player, I can remove the effect, but just partially. So by painting with 50%, it's going away to a degree, but only partially. So um, really, well, that's not a good way of seeing it. I was going to try and show you this. It's Right now, it's being applied fully in here and um, just partially out here. If I had this opacity up all the way, you'd really see that. So there, there you can see how it's actually being applied to what is below it. So the net effect is we've gone from something that looked like this. You know, it's a, it's a striking scene, but it, it needs a little bit of edge to something that looks more like this, which I think looks a lot closer to what you would see with uh, Nick's bleach bypass filter. So are you guys still there? We are. Well, we sure are. Yeah, that's a, that's a great technique. Not overly complicated, but very powerful. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that I use it... Um, Actually, quite a bit. Um, it's 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 quick and dirty, and it's and it gets the job done. And the nice thing is, you can get different looks here um, by playing around with overlay, soft light, and um, and hard light. You're gonna get you're gonna get different looks with each of them. Like right now, with soft light at about 50% opacity, I'm getting really. It's almost like a, um, it's not the same as clarity, but it's it's almost like a little bit of a clarity boost. Uh, when you know I what it looks like? It looks to me like the high-pass sharpening. Yeah, yeah. so the high-pass sharpening has that nice wide um, radius on it. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Well, so, that's really um, neat, but I have a question, which is the reason I don't use the HDR doning is because I don't know what those sliders do. And I really like to know. I don't like this thing about just drag the sliders around willy-nilly. I think that works if you're a really good artist, but for the for those of us who have kind of defaulted to the camera because we can't, you know, we don't have that art thing going on. I, I think like that's that. difficult. Willy really nilly, that, that's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I hear what you're saying, Jan, and I don't, I don't believe you, but because uh, <laughs> I know how good you are, but but you're so good at, at at helping out audience members who you know might be more new to this, and it's fantastic because um, all of us are at different places with with our art and our our you know our Photoshop skills. So. Um, if I go here into HDR toning, um, I'll do my best to explain it, but you noticed in here I only used, what was it, maybe five of the sliders. Um, and for this particular technique, you don't need to use them all. Saturation is pretty straightforward. That controls the intensity of the color. Detail, think of this as just the um, edginess. This is like the edginess slider. If there is a single edginess slider, this is it. Um, that is the one that really pops out the contrast, but it does it in kind of a unique way. Um, radius is the thickness 
of the halo. So in other words, where you have an edge, which and an edge is represented by a light pixel meeting a dark pixel, um, where you have an edge, um, the radius determines how thick that edge is. So as I go um, one direction or another, and let me zoom this up a little bit, maybe you can see it better. It's it's hard with HDR. It's really hard to show this show this stuff, but you can see there's a much more defined edge, and this one is is much less defined. It's a it's I guess it's a wider radius right there, and this you one's really more narrow. You really see that on the on the guy's hat. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if I go this way, you can see it's it's really kind of softened the edges out, and I go this way, and it's really hardened those edges up. Um, by having a, a more narrow uh, radius, a, a, a thinner line. And then the strength, this is taking that edge, and it's taking the light half of the edge, and it's making it brighter, and it's taking the dark half of the edge, and it's making it darker. So this is, um, you can see right there as I crank that up, it's, it's really popping into that to edge. And actually, with that strength cranked up, you might be able to see radius even better. Let's try this. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. It's it's not as easy to um, see visually as it would be if we were say in the Unsharp Mass dialog where you can really break it down. But here it's 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 basically the same idea. The radius is the thickness of the edge. The strength is how bright it makes the bright half and how dark it makes the dark half. And then the detail is the overall sort of grunge uh, application. Saturation, I drained away the color. And then last, I came into highlight here because my highlights were really getting blown, and I just knocked back the highlights, uh, knocked back those tones independent of the shadows, which you have that slider right here. Thank you. That's yeah. great. Sure, sure. All right, so um, I think I'll close this one unless there's any more discussion to be had around it. Okay. No, I'm good with it. I like it. All right. I'm going to so have Willy Nilly in my head all night, though, that you said that you said that, Jan. I like that. Willy Nilly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now what I want to talk about is um, something called photo tangling. And uh, this was brought to my attention back in June. I taught a workshop here in Boulder, and um, one of my students is an iPhone junkie. Um, maybe she's watching tonight. So, Irene, if you're, if you're watching... Uh, uh, she she absolutely loves the uh, the iPhone and um, she's got all the apps, all the great apps for it. And one of them um, she indicated is called Photo Tangler. I don't I know if that's actually the name of it, but that's what she was calling it. And so that's what popped into my head uh, this Photo Tangler app. And what it was doing um, is. And I'm actually wondering. I'm going to see if I can show you a few quick examples of this because I have happen to have a few of Irene's images right here where she has tangled stuff. So it I'm just going to me, though, I'm Mark, pop through uh, just a few of her images here. This is totally spontaneous. I forgot I had these sitting in, sitting in front of me. But she's taken various photos, and it's it's a brand of compositing, but it's, it's a brand of very soft-edged compositing. So you're blending these images together into this beautiful work of art. And um, along with it, you're seeing... Um, a little bit of, let's see if I can find that, a little bit of texture uh, being introduced into the scene. So it's like you have this soft edge blending between the images, you have a texture overlay, and in some cases, like this one, it, it almost looks like there is, you know, there's some sort of toning. Um, I guess you could call that vignette toning happening here um, at the edges of the photo. And so I, when I saw this, I was like, wow, that is just beautiful stuff. Surely we can do this in Photoshop. So I came up with, um, you know, again, a fairly straightforward technique for being able to accomplish something like this using Photoshop's tools instead of what you have um, with an iPhone app. So uh, we're going to take this image and we're going to tangle it with this image here, and then we're going to overlay with this texture that you see right here. So since I know I want to tangle this image and this image right here in Bridge, and you could do this very same thing um, in Lightroom, uh, you want to select both the images or all of the images that you're going to work with. So um, I might, when it comes to choosing images, I might consider choosing images that are in a theme. For instance, here the the theme is um, flowers, and it happens to be kind of pastel flowers, and actually flowers that have nice complementary colors um, 
work nicely. So you can think about a theme, or you could think about opposites, uh, or you could just simply work with colors that complement each other, or perhaps shapes, you know, shapes and lines that somehow kind of lead into each other. So there's different ways of thinking about what images you might select. But in this case, I'm using flowers as the theme, and I'm going with colors that I think harmonize nicely, and I like the way the kind of the lines of both of these flower images flow in a um, vertical orientation. So that's why I selected these. Did I know this would work before I tried it? Absolutely not. In fact, I rarely ever know if something is going to work. I have a sense about it because I've worked on a lot of images, but for me, the, what, what makes I image making exciting is experimenting and not being afraid to, to, you know, air quotes here, to fail because, you know, you just got to go for it. And so I got these two images here in Bridge. You can do this in Lightroom. In Bridge, you would choose Tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. If you're working in Lightroom, that's going to be um, photo, edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. I just okay. showed that last week, so it's perfect timing. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right, so um, here it is. I have a two-layer document. I'll switch off the visibility for the top layer, and you can see there's, there's the layer below. I want to reposition these. Um, so that I can have this tangle. That means I need to take the visibility for this top layer. I'm going to call this my blue-purple flower layer. I want to take it and reduce it. And so I'll hover over the word opacity and just scrubby slide to the left until I can see a blend of the two flowers. Now I'm going to go down to the underlying layer, which is the pink flower that you see here. Activate that layer. Choose the Move tool. And I want to slide it downward right along the y-axis. So if I want to slide right along that y-axis, I can hold the shift key. And that allows me to drag down. And I'll go to maybe there. Again, I can move this after the fact. So it's, this is all kind of an organic process of experimentation. So I dropped it down. Now I'm going to go back to the blue-purple flower layer, activate that, and crank the opacity back up to 100 just by scrubby sliding right over, over the top. So I want to blend these two together, and to simulate what's going on with that app, it needs to be a very smooth, gradual transition. That means I am going to run a gradient through a mask. So I need to add a mask to this top layer, and I can add that mask by clicking on the front loader right down here. Then I can go to the gradient tool that we have right here. And when you're doing this, it's fun to experiment using both the default uh, linear gradient and this radial gradient right here. So I would definitely encourage you to try the linear and the radial and see what happens. Now, um, in terms of creating the blend, the best way to do this is to come over to the gradient picker. So I'm clicking on this inverted triangle, and I'm going to choose this foreground to transparent option. All right? And it just so happens that my foreground is currently black, which is perfect because that's the color that, when applied to a mask, hides the layer. So I'm going to run a black to transparent through here. And I want to hold the shift key because, again, I want to slide right along that y-axis, so vertically. So I hold shift, slide through here. You can see the distance that I traveled. Let me undo that with Command or Control Z, and I'm going to show you what happens if I travel a longer versus a shorter distance. So if I hold shift and travel this whole distance, travel that whole distance, that creates a very gradual transition between those two layers. Do you have to, Mark, do you have to undo, or can you just redraw the gradient? Since I'm working with a uh, foreground to transparent gradient, um, I need to undo. If I were working with a foreground, or if I were working with the, um, the black to white gradient, then I could just keep going, and it would just replace the previous gradient. But because I'm working with foreground to transparent, you can actually lay multiple gradients in here. And so if you want to get rid of um, one, you want to undo it immediately. 
that's really useful information, particularly the idea that you can have multiple gradients on that same mask if you use uh, the dark to transparent. Yeah, in fact, if you see if you see the foreground, see, I'll just come in from the two gradients right there and just show you. You can see, and here's the mask. Neat. Ah, all right. Learn something new every day. Okay, so I've got the um, I've got this. I was going to show you. I did a long, gradual one a moment ago. Now I'm going to do a short one. So I'll hold a shift and just pull a short distance. So that that creates a much harder edge for you know traditional photographers who've worked with um, with filters in the field. <laughs> you might think of this one as a hard edged um, graduated neutral density filter, whereas this one right here would be a soft edge graduated neutral density filter. Um, but anyway, you have all this control, and that's using the linear. Again, on when you're on your own time, uh, try the radial too because it's neat. That creates more of a circular circular gradient, and it does some nice things with blending images. So I kind of like the way this is coming together, but I want to go in and um, have a little bit more precision over the blend here. For instance, this spot right down here. Um, I'm not real happy with having that show through from the underlying layer. Actually, no, it's not from the underlying layer. That's on this top layer. So it's still visible from the top layer. I want to get rid of that. So that means while I'm still working on the mask here, which you, you know that because I've got the little photo corners right around the edge of the mask. That means the mask is active. While I'm working on the mask, I can use the brush tool. Black is the uh, foreground color here. Right now I'm at 50% opacity. I want to tap 0 to get to 100%. Now shrink my brush with the left bracket key. Now I'm going to paint over this right here. So I want to eliminate that. I might also come up into here and let's just see. I'm painting with 100% just so I can see what I'm doing and then I'm going to command or control Z that. I want to paint with maybe 30%. So I'm going to tap 3 to set my opacity for the brush to 30%. I'll shrink it down. And I want to just allow a little, I want to sort of feather in a little bit more of that pink because, because I like that pink. It's beautiful. And I want, to, I want it to sort of feather into that region right up there just a little bit more. So if I show you the mask, you can see by painting with 30% opacity, I have a gray on there. That means I'm getting a really nice blend between those two layers in that particular region. Now this um, spot right here where this is reaching down, let me see what happens if I bring that out a little bit more. So that is on this blue purple flower layer. That means I want to be painting with white. So I can either click on the tiny arrow that you see here or I can tap X to exchange those colors so that white's the foreground. Still working with the brush here. And I'm going to go to maybe 50% opacity, so I'll tap 5. And I want to build this in just gradually. Make a brush smaller with that left bracket. And I'm going to go in a little bit stronger right here. What the heck? I don't know. It's <laughs> this is definitely creative process. So this is an, the idea of um, using the brush at varying opacities, going from black to white, and sort of painting in areas. I got one more spot I want to hit right here. I want a little bit more of this stem to be visible right there. So I can paint over that with that same white brush at 50%. And so I'm going to shrink my brush. A little bit too strong, so maybe I'll make it 30%. Just pull a little bit more of that, uh, that stem for this particular flower so it looks like it's emerging from the pink flower below. And by the time you're done with this, you'll probably have a mask that looks like you've really spent some time on it. So you, at this point, you have tangled your two images in order to give it the look of what I saw in that app, we need to apply a texture to this. And I'm just going to check in and make sure that I'm lecturing to um, other people. Are you guys still there? Well, we're we're still here. here. Okay, yeah. good, good. I'm trying it as you go. <laughs> so I'm going to go over to this image here, which is a texture. I'll go ahead and open that up. This texture, by the way, came from a um, free texture website called Shadow House Creations. Lots of amazing free textures on Shadow House Creations. So that is a that is a gem. That's a real treasure of a discovery. <laughs> um, all right, I want to move this into the other scene. So I'll again do select all. 
and edit copy. And some of you are probably thinking, why isn't he dragging this over and you know dropping it into the other photo? You can absolutely do that too. Whichever approach you prefer. Now I'm going to choose edit paste. And there it is. Now what I want to do is blend this with the image below. And the nicest way to blend is just what we did when we were working with that grunge, drama, and edginess secret weapon. We used blend modes. So we're going to use blend modes right here. But this time, instead of looking only at soft light, overlay, and hard light, I want to cycle through all the options. And if you want to cycle through the blend mode options, you want to activate the move tool, which is not intuitive at all, but that's what you do. You activate the move tool. And then hold the shift key and tap plus. And as you do this, it's going to change the blend mode here, and it's going to blend the photo in different ways with what's below. And I'm just going to continue cycling through here until I see something that I like. And that's where I first arrive at something I like. It happens to be overlay. I'm going to look at soft light now. In fact, when I'm doing this for real, I look at all the options because I, I really like to know the possibilities. It's great to know what's out there. It's the same concept that I use when I'm in the field shooting. Um, before I actually pull out the camera and start shooting, I scout around, you know, everywhere. And, and I lay down on my belly or, you know, crawl, climb up on a ladder or whatever. Um, give yourself the full view, the full range of choices before you settle on something. And that's going to make your art, I think, more engaging. So here I'm going to go with the soft light. You can see, if you look, it has imparted a very subtle but beautiful kind of impressionistic painterly texture to this photo tangle. So, can I um, ask you a question, Mark? Sure. When you're choosing textures to use, how do you choose, you know, what are you looking for? Well, it usually is a couple of different things. Probably the, I'd say the main thing I look for is textures that have subtle detail. If you have a texture that's really pronounced, you know, big, bold, um, contrasty areas, those textures just in general don't work as well as these really subtle textures like the one you're seeing right here. You can see that's just a bunch of fine little beautiful details. So that's, a, that's probably the number one thing I think about is I've got to find something that's got just subtle beautiful details. The other thing I look at, and this kind of negates what I said first in, in certain instances, is sometimes I'll, I'll be working on kind of a concept. So, for instance, I have, I have a, um, one of these montages where I photograph some spring flowers, some spring tulips, and I wanted to montage that, them with something wintry because it was, the idea was sort of these opposites of, of you know, birth and, and you know, um, What's the word I'm looking for when things just go to sleep? They are dormant. Hibernate. <laughs> Hibernation or dormancy, and then the idea of rebirth, you know. And um, so I, sometimes when I'm going after a concept like that, I thought, well, what winter texture could work here? And I came up with ice crystals. Um, so, so the idea there is, you know, those ice crystals are pretty big and bold, but I wanted to give them a shot. And so, um, but just because they felt right for the concept. And so in that instance... I, I threw out the window this idea of having these tiny little details <laughs> like the texture that you see here and I just went with something that was within that theme. Great, thank, good answer. So um, to finish this out and think of this next step as you know like optional but again when we looked at Irene's beautiful photo tangles we saw that at least one of those had some toning around the borders of the scene and so if we want to add in a little bit of toning we can do that very simply by adding a hue saturation adjustment layer. So I'm going to come up here into the adjustments panel I'm going to click on this icon right here that is hue saturation. Some people prefer to get to their adjustment layers by going to layer new adjustment layer and locating it here. Um, still others prefer going down to the black and white cookie icon at the base of the layers panel and choosing it from here. So um, however you get there really doesn't matter. Um, I'm just going with this option here. I'm going to add a hue saturation adjustment layer and in order to tone this I'll click the box that says colorize. So I'll just check right here and now I can pick the hue or the kind of the base color 
by sliding right up here where it says hue. And so I'll go with uh, I'll go with a nice sepia in this instance, and then I can pick the intensity of that color by working with the saturation slider. So I can get a nice intense sepia or something much more subtle. I'm going to go with pretty subtle here, I think. All right, so that has toned the whole picture. I really want this to tone a very small part of the picture. Since what I'm trying to tone um, is going to be way less than 50% of this, I can save a lot of time. Rather than painting over, say, 90% of the picture with black, I can save a lot of time by just filling my mask with black and then painting over about 10% of it with white. So if I want to fill that mask with black, what I'm really doing is I'm inver inverting the white color of the mask to black. And when you want to invert, you choose Image, Adjustments, Invert, or, as you can see here, a logical shortcut, Command or Control I. So I'll invert that white to black. Then I'll activate the brush. White is my foreground color. Um, I'll go ahead and set this back to 100% up here, and to do that very quickly, just tap 0. And I'm going to shrink my picture down a little bit and make my brush bigger using that right bracket key. And now I'm going to come in here and just sort of kiss the edges of this with this toning. Oh, that's nice. I like the way you say you're kissing the edges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see here, there's the mask. The white areas represent where the hue saturation toning effect is happening, and black represents where it's not happening. And the result is you go he from here to here. And again, it's just we're just playing into trying to um, mimic the look that we're seeing here. Uh, and if you use these concepts uh, that we've worked with right here, um, and you come up with some, some nice photos to use, then I think you could tangle something up that would be absolutely awesome. Um, this is something I actually, in, I haven't had a lot of spare time lately, but when I get some more spare time, I'm, I'm going um, to start tangling a lot more images. <laughs> <That's> beautiful. <laughs> really gorgeous. But, you know, the thing is, like if I do that, it's never going to look the way it is when you do. There's something, you have a sense, Mark, you know, uh, that just makes it really special. Well, that's nice of you to say, Jan, but I, I, I think that you just have a little voice in you that is telling you can't, you can't do this. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I honestly believe that if, uh, if you can eliminate that voice from your head the same way I'm trying to eliminate a lot of voices from my own head that, that hold me back, I guarantee you got it in you. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do and everybody who's watching has it in them. It's, uh, it's, it's tricky because um, we've all got, all got stuff that blocks us, but... Um, you know, it's uh, fearless, fearless experimentation. I, I just encourage that in everybody. No, good idea. Well, I know you started out as a straight photographer, right? Yeah, I, I, I did. I, um, I used to use a medium format camera. I would set it on a tripod for every, every shot, and I shot big, grand-scale scenics that were tack sharp from front, front to back, and that was the first few years of my, my photographic experience, and it was perfect for me at that time. It was lovely. And um, since then, I've evolved through dozens of other other experimental phases. And um, every time I allow myself to actually branch out a little bit and and, and um, you know experiment, uh, I I grow you know richer I think as an artist and richer as a person. So uh, um, well, yeah. And and what it says to me is that you don't have to just say this is all I can do. I I hear what you're saying to me. And do you mind if I tell a little secret about what what you were doing back then is that do not want people to know that. Oh, you can, whatever. I'm, I'm fair game. I'm wide open. Yeah. So I was going to say that where I met Mark, my gosh, it must have been in the 90s or something. I think it was. It was. Mid-90s. Um, Mid-90s, yeah. You can say what it was. Where were you working? What were you doing? Well, yeah, I was, I was working at uh, Photocraft Labs. I had, um, I had just released myself from being a television editor. I, that's, that was my former career and I was, uh, I was burning out pretty fast, and I knew I loved photography. In fact, I had this intense passion for it, and I wanted to get into the photographic industry. And when I moved out here to Bol to Boulder in '96, um, I, uh, I, you know, I left behind the television editing, and I took a job and a major pay cut, <laughs> a major pay cut, and I went to work at um, Photograph Labs right here in Boulder. And 
that was a neat experience because for, you know I got to see the behind the scenes working of everything in the lab but I I also made contact with hundreds of completely interesting people and very inspiring photographers and so it opened my eyes to a whole lot of possibilities that I had never even imagined and um and I started teaching on the side because I knew Photoshop really well from working in the broadcast industry and and um, just started teaching on the side of to people who wanted to know more about Photoshop because it was just kind of coming on the scene at that point in time for for still photographers they, they really weren't using it that much and so there was a big audience a lot of, lot of people who wanted to to learn it and uh, started teaching on the side and started getting so much work doing that that I eventually left Photocraft and started teaching full time. Yeah, I don't know if people know Photocraft was was a kind of a high end pro photographer um, film lab, right? Like you brought in your film and you waited how many days and then you got the pictures back. Just we like, we had a nice twenty four hour turn, so we <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we had to pay extra, I'm sure. But uh, but the thing is, though, Mark, you were like God to me in those days because you know you were the one who was in charge of my photos. You know, and I was like, oh my God, please <laughs> tell me how to get them good and what do I have to say to make sure that they develop them the way I want. And now we have all that control ourselves and it's a different world, isn't it? It, it really is. The, the photographic world since uh, since starting there at Photocraft, I think in 96 or whenever that was, photographic world has been turned on end. It's, it is so radically different in every conceivable way. It is. It's ex both exciting because we have so much potential and so many new opportunities, and it's also terrifying because it's so hard to keep up with. <laughs> I know, but like, well, Ron, you you were in the film world too, weren't you? Yeah, well, I sure was. Yeah. yeah. So there's some big. There's a really advantage to having done that sort of photography, do you think? Well, there's a, an incredible advantage to it. I, I think. I think a lot of photographers today coming up in the digital world are really missing out on on really grasping the the fundamental. Uh, way that photography works. We, they jump into it and everything just works for them. Um, so having a handle on the way the, the, the film recorded and now digital records, they're not really all that different. One used little silver halide crystals and another uses pixels, but they're very similar and learning how that worked was, I think, really advantageous to me. And I think I think nowadays you can learn so much more quickly because you have the immediate feedback of the image on the LCD, and even more importantly, you have the histogram right in front of you, and so uh, you can very quickly start to understand how you know I shot this scene. Um, you know the, those highlights over there are blowing out. I've got a spike on the right side of the histogram. Uh, you know clearly I have captured a scene that looks beautiful to my eye, but it's beyond the. Uh, dynamic range of what you can actually capture with a single image so that's oh, yeah. where you would yeah. either step in with exposure compensation or you would bracket your exposure so that you could bring it together with HDR. Yeah, I was going to say that's extremely helpful for people that are doing more event style photography who are doing photography on the fly where they can see that they're getting their image quickly whereas Typically, you said you did uh, was it grand landscapes or grand vistas, and got them tack sharp. Where you could spend time with your light meter and make sure the different zones were there. Um, having that ability uh, to look at the back of the camera is even more important when things are moving really quickly, like at a wedding or an event or photojournalism, where you're really panicking. If you don't get to see that image and you got to wait a week, <laughs> that could be really <laughs> really even stressful. Even in those grand scale scenic moments, um, you know, last thing I wanted to be doing, and I was doing it because it's what you did, but I didn't want to be holding a light meter up at the scene. I wanted to be in my right brain, not my left brain, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting creative with the composition and everything I was doing, and that was just taking away from the process. We don't have to worry about that anymore, and, and that's so beautiful. Plus, you know, I was potentially out at a location that I hiked my, you know, a long distance to get to, and you know, and the light's perfect, and so even then, you know, you, you had to work at it and get a sense of what you were doing, uh, but without the immediate feedback, if, if you know, if you didn't know what you were doing, it was, uh, it was a little bit intimidating. Yeah, it does sharpen your skills, though, having to get it right first time. <laughs> well, I'm a, one thing that, um, you know, it constantly probably comes on you guys' radar as well, but one thing that comes on my radar a lot uh, still is... You know, there, there, among some people, there's this, this 
stigma about using Photoshop. You know, the kind of this purest attitude of, of um, you know, get it right in camera <laughs> and only only do things that you could do in camera or that you could do in a traditional darkroom. And, you know, I certainly can respect people who are in that, that position, but um, I'm a real advocate of uh, the idea of absolutely learn your camera, learn how to get it right in camera, because that that allows you as a creative artist to make it even better using Photoshop. But Photoshop to me, and probably to you guys sitting here, since I'm preaching to the choir, is, is this, um, it's just an extension of my creativity. It's another tool I use to be able to express my vision. And it, um, you know, I don't even see any difference between Photoshop and the camera or, or Lightroom and the camera at all uh, any, anymore. And, I guess I'm the reason I'm bringing this up is just because I'm trying to spread that message. You know, have people open their mind to the idea that we're we're creative people, and the tools that we're using, um, they don't matter. <laughs> yeah. As long as you are enjoying your creative process and you're pro producing images that al allow you to express whatever it is you want to express, then whatever tool you use is fantastic. Or whatever tool. You're preaching my sermon right there. I totally agree with that. I was a photo restoration and retouch artist before Photoshop, and I was never a purist then either because I manipulated images. I manipulated with dyes and negatives and prints, but I still wasn't a purist at that point. And, and I really believe that the tools we have today have opened up a world of creativity that no one's ever had access to. And yeah. it's just, I think it's wonderful. It is, and you know, what I keep telling people is, look, this is a false distinction to say, you know, people, there are manipulated photos and non-manipulated. First of all, the artist's eye behind the camera, you know, behind the lens is manipulating what gets shot. So right away, you're, you're involving yourself in that process before you even take the picture. But beyond that, nowadays, so many people are shooting raw. It's not just pro, you know, photographers. It's pretty, a lot of people. And so at that point, you you pretty much have to do something with the photo unless you're just absolutely willing to take the most dummy down version because all you're getting out of your camera are the brightness values that have been recorded on your sensor mm -hmm. and nothing has been done to them no sharpening no color um, enhancement um, none of that and so you have to do it now it's it, it, the idea that you could just take a raw photo out of your camera and publish it in a magazine it seems not correct to me Am I, do you agree with that or what do you think Absolutely. Well, I think it's all about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ron. I was gonna say, go ahead, Dave. Now, <laughs> Dave. Dave. yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, if you put, you know, your camera into the, a JPEG mode or using a cell phone, it's, you know, it's it's adding a bunch of saturation and and sharpness. There's there's editing going on there. It's just the camera is taking control. It's, uh, I, you know, it's I much prefer taking over that control rather than the camera burning it in for me. But it, it's there's no there's no um, question that that modification is occurring. Um, yeah. and, I think, and I think less people are shooting JPEGs. I think you know they've gotten they've heard that part of the message. They're like, oh, yeah. well, I should be shooting raw. But they, but then at that point, you're not really getting much. You're just getting, you know, as I said, brightness values. And you have to do something to it. I mean, for me, it's it is really all about intention and transparency. In other words, my intention is to create images that are compelling and that express what I want to express. So for me, anything goes. Now, if I'm shooting an image for the Denver Post, then I have a totally different intention. You know, I am trying my best to, in an unbiased way, and i got to air quote that, but, um, you know, document a moment. And so, you know, intention really determines a lot of things. And then the other piece of that is that transparency because, uh, Everybody, no matter what your goal, whether it's me and my art or you know the Denver Post guy, we need to be 100% transparent with with our audience. And you know, I I tell people, here's what I did in camera, here's what I did in Photoshop. Again, I don't see a distinction between them; they're just creative tools for me as a, as an artist. But um, here's what I did, and I'm I'm excited about this. You know, and the same thing would go for that that Denver Post photographer. You know, if they if they did manipulate anything, be it color or brightness or contrast, or you know, th they would just need to be able to let people know that um, with complete transparency. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with that. Well, Mark, I realize that you didn't show us your text and photo technique. 
Yeah. No, I'm going to ask you once again. Will you come back, please? <laughs> I, I love being on the show, guys. It's it's a real pleasure, and it's actually it's, it's nice for me to be here with you guys tonight. This is my my first hangout since we had the flood here in Boulder uh, five and a half weeks ago, and I lost my office, so I'm sitting in a completely different room in my house, and I was kind of nervous about how things would go tonight because I don't have a wired internet connection, and um, it's wonderful to be sitting talking with friends about something that I'm passionate about. And um, so, you know, if you give me this opportunity again, I'll come back and show, show the audience whatever they want to want to hear about. That's cool. And I will say you have so much free content on your own website, which can you tell us again the URL? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually listed with my, my lower third there. It's msjphotography.com. And actually, one final note, since we since the last 10 minutes of this show have really been talking about, um, I guess you could say, setting your creative spirit free and transparency and intention and all this. I, I have a blog post that went live today um, on my website that talks about just that um, and in a really kind of supportive, encouraging way. So if anybody's looking for um, you know, something that, that may inspire and, and um, uh, infuse fuse them with some some uh, useful ideas, then check out my my site today. Oh, you should really go, guys. I'm not kidding. I go there all the time because Mark is so generous with his tutorials, and they're fantastic. You won't find anything else like them. Each one is unique. Um, some illustrative techniques, some wonderful photographic techniques, and Photoshop, and every, it's just great. So we really, I, you're very nice to do that, Mark. And Mark cool. has provided some uh, some URLs straight into uh, some of the things he, he showed tonight, the, the grunge drama, edginess, secret weapon, and, uh, and the photo tangling. Um, will be, uh, the links will be there in the event and also on the U YouTube page. So you can come back Great. and, and get a direct link to those. Neat. Well, it's that time, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we really appreciate it. It was wonderful to talk with you again, Mark. And I'm so glad to see Ron and Dave again. Hi, guys. <laughs> bye, guys. Yeah, <laughs> hi, bye. bye. Um, and so, uh, Mark, I just hope you'll keep producing wonderful art and uh, continue to teach as many people as you can because you really have the gift for it. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to get in front of your audience tonight. All right, then. Bye, everyone. See you, guys. See you later.